It's good to be able to bring God's word to you this morning, and um, and we'll be looking uh, this morning at the uh, next part of this series of sermons, the High Priestly Prayer of Jesus, as it's often called. And you'll find the text in John 17. John 17. And um, I'll read that out to you, uh, which is going to be verses 11 through to verse 19 this morning, which is the, uh, sometimes called the second petition, uh, not the second, but the third uh, petition of Jesus. Uh, so verse, starting at verse 11. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but that thou shouldst keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. So, if we take this from verse 11, Jesus starts off by speaking about events as if they've already happened. He says, now I am no more in the world. So previously he'd been prophesying about these events, uh, as in Matthew 17, 22 to 23, he said, the Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men and they shall kill him, and the third day he shall be raised again. Do you remember the disciples were saying, no, no, that's not going to happen, or they were just like really quiet, and like, what does he mean? But now we can see, that as, it, as it comes closer to it, now Jesus is calling those things which be not as though they were. He's saying, I'm no longer in the world, you know, because, because that's going to happen. It's certain that this is going to happen. So he starts to speak about himself in that way. But this is more than just a retelling uh, of, of the biblical narrative this morning. I'm not just going to say, oh, Jesus said this and, and then he said that. There would be no point in that. We can just read the Bible for that. But there are things here that we can take for ourselves and make application to ourselves in our lives. Really important teaching in this. Uh, high priestly prayer and there are three things that I want us to take from this this morning that I believe are in this section in this passage that we're looking at this morning one is a lesson in obedience two is a warning about apostasy and three is a call to sanctification and that's what I'm going to be really talking about this morning Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, that your word is before us. Um, Lord, that we have truth before us, Lord, that we have the power of your word, Lord, the, the wisdom of your word. We pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would start to just show us the depths of this word and how to make application of it to our own lives, Lord, and, and, and as to what it tells us about the Lord Jesus Christ and how we can know him more deeply. Lord, I ask that you'd help 
as I come to preach this word this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. So Jesus says, I am no more in the world. So he has decided that he will follow this mission that will take him to the cross, that will take him to certain death. He has decided he's going to do it. He's going to, he's going to go all the way and he's going to become a sacrifice. Uh, for a sacrifice for the whole world. The Apostle Paul says Jesus humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, Philippians 2 verse 8. So this is Jesus humbling himself. How did he humble himself? Well, firstly, Jesus humbles himself by becoming a man. Remember, Jesus didn't begin, you know, you know, Christ himself, the Son of God, does not begin in a stable in Bethlehem. You know, he, he is pre-existent, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. What happens is the Son takes flesh to himself and becomes a man. You know, if you want to know more about that, Philippians 2 has a whole section on, on what happened, uh, how uh, the Son of God uh, became became the Son of Man. So that's the first uh, humbling that Jesus does. He, he becomes a man. He takes on human flesh to himself. He allows himself to be limited by a body, by living in a body. So we read that Jesus gets hungry. He gets tired. You know, all the things that we experience of living in this body, the restriction of it, so on. God himself took on human flesh willingly humbled himself to become a man. Secondly, he humbled himself by walking in obedience to his father. Remember, he had a choice. He prays and says, not my will be done but thine. Not, not my will but yours. And, and, and that's a humbling, isn't it? It's saying, well, I'm not going to just do what I want to do because he knew the cross was coming. He knew that pain and that shame was coming. It wasn't something he willingly wanted to do. But he said, well, no, I am going to be obedient to my Father. So, so by submitting himself uh, to that, to the Father's will, not my will, but thine, is the second way in which he became, uh, hum that he humbled himself. And the third way that he humbled himself was by submitting to death on a cross, which was not a pleasant death. And, 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 but more than that, it involved public humiliation. Okay, God became a man, he humbled himself, he, he willingly went to that death. Uh, he put himself, himself in the hands of wicked men, allowed them to do what they wanted to do, and he, he subjected himself to public humiliation, being placed alongside common criminals. So that in the eyes of the people at that time, this was an ignominious end. This was a shameful, humiliating end. And that's the first lesson that we can take from this. Are you willing to go all the way with God? To say, not my will, God, but yours. You know, are you willing to be humiliated, misunderstood, maligned by other people for the sake of being obedient to God? You know, we must learn to imitate Christ, not just in his humility. But in his resolve that this is what I am going to do, you know. But so often as human beings, don't we? We have, we have do you have that like every year uh, when it comes to New Year, we have New Year resolutions, right? I am not going to have any chocolate cake this year, or whatever it is, you know. That, that's it. I'm going to I'm going to look after myself. I'm going to get fit. I'm going to I'm going to stop uh, losing my temper. You know, whatever you choose to do or say. But often. By the time it gets to the end of the year, we're like, oh yeah, that, that, that resolution that I made, you know, what's happened to it? 
But we must resolve by God's grace, uh, like Christ did, that we're going to go all the way with God, right to the end. That we're going to run our race successfully. Knowing that God gives us that grace, gives us that hope, gives us that strength through his Holy Spirit. So that we can say, not my will, but thine be done. We're also taught by Jesus. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Luke 9, 23 says. So, so it's like, well, Jesus had a cross, right? And, uh, and he carried, at least a part, that, that cross. So Jesus is saying, you also have a cross that you must carry. And that if you want to follow him, you're going to have to take up that cross. Well, well what is a cross? It is anything, really, that your flesh recoils against. You know, it could be that God is saying to you, I want you to go and speak to that family member about me. And the very thought of it sends you into a panic. The very thought of it is like, I couldn't, I couldn't do that. You know, that would be, they, what, if, what, if they, what if they laugh at me? What if they humiliate me? And again, we're drawn back to this image of Christ on the cross, right? He said, I'm doing this. I know I will be humiliated. I know people will mock me. I know they will say things that are not true. But I have decided this is what I will do. I will take up my cross. And we also have to deny ourselves or deny our flesh and take up that cross, take up that thing that is, is repulses our flesh that we don't want to do. Um, it, it could be, you know, right, I'm, I'm going to stop gossiping about people. Oh, my flesh loves it so much. You know, wants to do that. I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to start fellowshipping with other, with other Christians. Oh, but I'm the sort of person who likes to do it on their own. It's like, these are the things, this is what taking up your cross means. It's those things that our flesh recoils against them and that doesn't want to do. But we know God is telling us this is the right thing for you to do. And it might be different for, for I'm not just really talking about uh, uh, sins, but I'm talking about this could be something specific for you that might not, you know, uh, what James says, he who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. So like it, 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 you know, it might not be the right thing for me to go to China and become a missionary, but it might be the right thing for you. You know, so, so it's like, well, what is God telling you to do? You have to take up that cross, deny yourself, and take up your cross and follow him. And we have this example of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and what he and what he did. Deny yourself. Deny what you want, like, need, and take up your cross every day. Imitate uh, Jesus. Now, now the point of a cross is that it it kills you. That's why they crucify people. It kills you, and this will kill your rebellious nature, your corrupt flesh, by taking up this cross, by taking up. By doing that thing that God wants you to do and your flesh does not want to do. And, did you know, it will prove your love for Jesus. It will prove your love. See, there is no question that God loves us. But the question is, do you love God? And how do we prove that? How do we know? Well, in John 15, verse 15, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. So in obedience to Christ, this is a test, this is the measure really of how much I love Jesus. If I keep his commandments, if I keep his word, then it shows that I do truly love him. So let's have a look at uh, a bit more at John 17. Um, Verse 12, Jesus says, while I was with them, he means the disciples, in the world, I kept them 
in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. So, so perdition means destruction, the son of destruction. Uh, and it's a reference to Judas Iscariot, who you'll remember betrayed Jesus. And it says that the scripture might be fulfilled. So in other words, this was in the foreknowledge of God. God knew that Judas was going to betray Jesus. And it's clear from the events that take place uh, at what we call the Last Supper that Jesus also knew that Judas was going to betray him. He says to him, go on, go and do what, what you plan to do. And it happens that way so that the scriptures might be fulfilled, so that the word of God might be proved to be true. Psalm 41 verse 9 says, Yea, my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. So, so Jesus predicts um, several times that Judas is, is going to betray him. Yet did Judas have his own will? Couldn't he have said, not, not my will, but thine? In Leviticus 1 verse 3, uh, God tells the children of Israel to bring a sacrifice, quote, of his own voluntary will. His own voluntary will. So you have your own voluntary will, I have my own voluntary will. The fact that God knows that Judas will betray Jesus doesn't mean that God, God is making it happen. You understand? God's foreknowledge of what will happen does not take away our freedom of choice. It just means that God knows what that choice will be. He, he knows the end from the beginning. It says in Isaiah 46 verse 10. God knows the end from the beginning. He knows what's going to happen. Judas could have chosen to remain faithful to the Lord Jesus, but instead he chose apostasy. He chose to deliberately reject Christ and to betray him. And uh, it's interesting, isn't it? We've been looking over these last few weeks and I talked to you about how the Father has given to the Son that the, the Spirit convicts that the Father draws us and he brings us to the Son and gives us to the Son. And yet, here is one that the Father had given to the Son and he, and he can still be lost. Yeah. So even though the Father has given to the Son, that person can still be lost. Look at Judas. Judas was chosen and yet he was also lost. He's the son of perdition, the one who brings destruction, not only by betraying Jesus to death, but also by causing his own death, by taking his own life. And this is a picture, a clear picture to me, of sin, of apostasy, of rejecting Christ, that whenever you reject Christ, you bring destruction upon others and upon yourself, upon your own soul. You, you become, as it were, a son of perdition, uh, a child of destruction, a child of wrath. And it's like, well, when you reject that gospel, when you reject Christ, you're bringing destruction upon yourself. And um, I was talking this morning to Carol, we were just talking about, you know, the Christian life. And, and you know, we've been Christians for a long time now. And, and, and I can kind of almost look back on my life and see, you know, the times of, of where I did something foolish, where um, uh, I did things that I'm not proud of. Always a time where I was away from the Lord. 
were, or where I was, I was lazy, I wasn't studying God's word every day, I wasn't praying every day, I'm not being drawn back into the world. And it's like those times were the worst times. And the times where I was close to God, where I was genuinely loving God and studying his word and praying and, and, and felt as close to God as I, as I could get, those were the times of blessing. Those were the times that I rejoiced in, you know, that I rejoice even now in the memory of them. And so, you know, take it from me, if you like, as, as, as somebody who's been a Christian for a long time now, um, those are the best times. The best place to be is close to God and, and, and walking in obedience to God. The worst place to be as a Christian is walking away from God. You know, is going back into, into the world. And um, that word, world, is used quite a lot here, isn't it? Uh, I pray for them. Uh, well, verse 9, he says, I pray for them. I pray not for the world. And, um, and, and it's mentioned really quite a lot in this section that we look at. Um, and and when, he, when he talks about the world here, he's talking about those people who are without Christ. Those people who have rejected Christ. So I want you to understand that when I use the word world this morning, I'm talking about those kind of people, those people who have uh, rejected Christ or who have never, have never really thought about Christ. And um, and this is that's why I believe this whole section is really a call to a sanctified or a holy life for for the church. I'm going to read you some verses now from uh, from here in John 17, verses 13 and um, and verse 15. Uh, what happened? Um, hang on. Okay. Um, oh, what's that? Oh, yes. So it's a call to a sanctified or a holy um, a holy life. So yes, verses 13 to 15. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but that thou shouldst keep them from the evil. So Jesus is saying, these disciples of mine, and by extension, Christians today, they're not of the world. They don't hold the same values and the same beliefs uh, or, or have the same kind of customs or practices to those who have rejected Christ. There's a difference, is what he's saying. But interestingly, he says, I'm not going to take them out of this world, out of this environment. I'm going to keep them right in it. And, and that's so different, isn't it, to a lot of kind of religions and cults and things where the idea is right. You know, we've got this completely different ethos, this completely different standards of, of worship and belief. And, and, and therefore, we're going to come away from this world. We're going to, you know, join a monastery or some kind of, uh, you know, community right away from everybody else. And we're not going to, we're not going to associate with them. Jesus is saying the opposite. He's saying, yes, that's true. We're not of this world. We're not like them. But you're going to remain in this world. You're going to stay there. I think it was, a, it was a letter of Ravenhill who said something like, this is a miracle that God does, where he takes an unholy person, makes them holy, and then puts them right back in, in the world. He says, right, you're going to stay there. You're going to be, you're going to be the imitation of Christ and his life to this, to this world. And that's so, I think that's so uh, powerful. That God is that God would would do that, and do you notice what He says in this section? He says, He says, when when I've given them Thy Word, I've given them the Word of God. He says, I've given them Thy Word, and the world 
the world has hated them. So by having that word, the word of God, and by, and by following God's word, he's saying the world, those who are without Christ, will hate you. Now, again in John 15, uh, verse 18, Jesus says, if the world hate you, you know it hated me before it hated you. So these are the people who've rejected Christ. He's saying, well, don't be surprised. You're a genuine Christian and you want to live God's word and you take that as being true. He says, guess what? The world will hate you for it. Not that the world will say, well, you know, good for you. Good for you. You follow your your book if you want to. Jesus said that they won't, they won't, they might say that, but they don't mean that. He's saying they'll hate you for it. They won't be saying, well, I, you know, I may not believe the same things as you do, but I respect your faith. He's saying, no, they won't, they won't be thinking that. They won't be saying that. Because when you genuinely start to do God's will, it will be offensive to them. Why? Because everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. John 3, verse 20. Saying, light here is truth, right? They say, those who are in darkness, they don't want the light, because the light reproves them, it exposes their sin. So let's say you're working with somebody, right? And you're working and you have a break and you sit down and start talking and they say, oh, I had a great night last night when I got drunk and, you know, kind of uh, picked up this girl. And you're like, well, that's a sin. You know, God says that that's wrong to do that. You've just exposed their life as sinful. You've shone the light of God's truth, God's word. It's not your opinion. It's what God says in his word. You've shone the light of God's word on that person's life and exposed that which is sin. And so they hate you for it. Because you become, you become that source of conviction. Okay? But this is, this is, this is the Christian life. He's, Jesus says, I've given them thy word. And the world hate, have hated them. Because they are not of the world. In other words, they don't share the same values and and you know, morality of people who've rejected Christ. The world is like going in one direction, the church is going in another. Everyone that doeth evil hates of the light. And John goes on to say, love not the world, nor the things of the world. So it's, it's like actually this actively saying, look, as a Christian, you should not be loving the world. You know what they what they love, nor the things of the world, and and this is like mystifying to people who aren't Christians. In fact, at the end of Romans chapter one, after a great litany of kind of sins, it says this: that the people who commit these sins, knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same but have pleasure in them that do them. And that actually, they can't understand why you don't throw yourself into the same kind of sin and, and why you don't hold the same opinions as them. It's a mystery to them. And therefore James says, friendship with the world is enmity with God. In other words, if you endorse the things that the world does and you start to act in the same way and, and you make intimate friendships with people who are not Christians who don't share your belief that the word of God is the truth then he says you become the enemy of God it's that serious so we are to be this holy people amongst the people who are unholy we have to live amongst them, work amongst them. You know, there, there are our family members and so on. 
our neighbours. We don't go and live up on a mountain in some, some monastery somewhere. We live amongst them. And we to pay attention to what we say, do, think, act, even our relationships, what we read, what we watch, even how we dress. But how are we to know what's worldly, what's not worldly? How, if it's so important to be kind of sanctified, separated, in, in not just in terms of we don't associate, but in terms of not adopting. Because you know, like in the Old Testament, part of the problem with the children of Israel was they adopted many of the standards and many of the practices of the nations around them. Like God said, right, you know, come to me, you're, you're separate, separate yourselves from them. But then they started following the culture and the customs of the people around them. It's like, well, how do you know what's worldly and what's not? You know, is that, can I watch TV? You know, is, uh, is it okay to have a beer now and again? You know, I mean, what, what is worldly, what's not worldly? How do I know? Where do we draw the line? And I'm pleased to say that I believe that Jesus answers that question in this text. In this passage, how to be sanctified, how to be separated, and it's in verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. So, once again, guess what? It comes down to this book, to the Bible, thy word is truth. So how do I sanctify, how do I separate myself from the world by living out this book, by living it? Not just by having it on my shelf and knowing a few passages or, you know, or setting myself a task, I'll read a chapter a day or whatever it is, but by actually living it out, by living Christ's commandments. And the problem is this, people say, well, you know, Live in the 21st century now. Let, let's take the view that this book was written, uh, let's say Genesis was written something like 3,000 years ago. Okay, uh, let's say 2,000 years ago. So that, uh, that I'm just kind of randomly, arbitrarily kind of picking a date. Um, I don't think anyone knows for sure. But let's say it was written 2,000 years, well, more than 2,000 years. Let's say 3,000 years ago. Okay, I'm saying, well, the Bible's 3,000 years old. You know, that's going to that's gonna date. I mean, if you read books from, uh, I mean, you'll occasionally read, you know, uh, Victorian literature or whatever, and it's like quite dated. You know, you read it and you think, oh, yeah, this is obviously not, not written in our day. So, so, like, how can a book that says 3,000 years old, how can that, how can I live that out? in the 21st century. You know, how, can, how would that work? How can I apply that? Uh, but if you turn to 2 Timothy, so 2 Timothy, chapter 3, we've got to ask ourselves, who actually wrote it? Who wrote this book that I'm, that I'm really building my life around, that I want to take and adopt as, as the, my guide through life? So 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 says this, All Scripture, I said this yesterday, didn't I? All Scripture, not just the words of Jesus, not well, just the New Testament, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And that doesn't mean like, oh, it was a really inspiring sermon this morning, or read an inspirational book. It literally means all scripture is God breathed, that God is the author. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So then we so now we find out that God then is the author. So like, if God is the author, it doesn't matter if it's 3,000 years old. 
It doesn't matter if it's three million years old or three billion years old or three trillion years old. Because God is an eternal being. He's not growing in his wisdom or, you know, he didn't start off not knowing very much and then he knew more and more. You know, God is omniscient. He is omnipotent. So if it's God, if God is the source, then it will not matter how old this book is. It is still relevant to me as one who follows Christ, as somebody who has been regenerated by the Spirit of God because it's applicable to my life now. And it does not need to be changed or corrected in light of culture today or, uh, or opinions today. Remember what it said? It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. So I don't correct it, it corrects me and how I'm living and what my life's like. You know, and I have to be open to that correction for, to allow God to correct my life and, and, and to show me, you know, and to, to, for me to yield to his wisdom. You know, God is not going to yield to our wisdom, our worldly thoughts in in the 21st century, we must yield to his wisdom. But here's a, a kind of a problem. So, if we want people to come to Christ, we've already realised that, that, that if I live this book, if I live out the Bible, if I take the word of God as true, the world will hate me. But then if I try and be like the world and try and kind of draw them to Christ by, you know, being like them and kind of, you know, maybe even dressing like them or, or sharing the same kind of customs in the hope that I'll draw people to Christ, then I become the enemy of God. And this is a real, this is a real challenge for churches, you know, it's like, well, how do we get those people out there in here? And, and I, and, and, I think the fact is actually quite a simple one. It's not like how do we get them into here. It's no, we go out to them. And that's what evangelism is. It's the church going out to the people. But you still have that problem. Of what, what do we do? Because, because, you know, I don't want to become the enemy of God by becoming like the world. But then if the world hates me uh, because I represent Christ, how will they be saved? And so there was, a, there was a survey done a few years ago. Um, the church, a number of churches decided we need some kind of, we need to go out and find out people's opinion on the church. You know, how, how can we get more people to church? And so they went out and they literally stopped people in the street. <coughs> they found people who were not going to churches. And they said, look, what would you like to see in a church? Now, what would make it attractive to you? And so, perhaps predictably, they said, well, uh, probably if the sermons were shorter, um, if, if it was less traditional, um, maybe if they had something like a cafe or you know, a coffee shop where we could kind of, you know, maybe if it was more fun, uh, then we might go to church. And so this whole movement started where people, Christians are like, well, that's it, that's the answer. We'll just do it when the sermons got shorter and, you know, uh, churches became more contemporary, everything was fun, uh, you know, it was not so, not so much heavy on the word. But after a while, somebody made an interesting point. They said, wait a minute. These are people who are not convicted of their sin. They're not people who are looking for God. And you've asked them, what kind of church would you like to be in? And so rather predictably, what they're saying is essentially a church where we're not going to be convicted. A church where there's not going to be preaching. A church, basically, a church without God. You know, get rid of all the God stuff. Get rid of the Bible. Get rid of all this preaching. Let's have fun. Let's have coffee. Let's have. So someone said, you know, isn't there a danger that we're actually designing churches for people who don't want God? You know, we're just designing like a facility that's going to appeal to people, you know, who like to kind of hang out and socialise. 
And so someone said, would it be better to choose a different, uh, what do you call it, demographic? Pick those people who are going to church and ask them, why did you go to that church? And obviously, there's lots of different reasons why people come to churches. And so, and so there were all different opinions given. But this might surprise you. The top answer, the main reason why people had started going to those churches, they said, was doctrine, teaching, teaching the Word of God. They said, we wanted to know what they believed. We wanted to know, what do you believe? How deeply do you believe in? How do you live out what you believe? And that's what people who went to those churches, that's why they went there in the first place. So we've got to be careful. We don't try as churches to kind of design a church that's for people who are not seeking God, who are not convicted of their sin. But you see, there's this little demographic in there. Yes, the world will hate you. But there are some people who have had enough of the world. There are some people who are no longer enthralled and besotted with the things of the world and they're seeking God, they're seeking truth. And that's where the church comes into their own. Because ironically, if you think that the key is to becoming as close to the world as possible without actually rejecting God, then those people who are seeking truth, those people who are seeking God, you're going to put them off. You're going to turn them away because they're like, well, we already have this. You know, we already have fun things to do. We already have great coffee shops. But what the church has is this unique gospel, this gospel of Jesus Christ, this means of salvation. And whilst, yes, Jesus came to his own and his own received him not, but to those who did receive him, he gave them power to become the sons of God, the children of God. And that's where, where we are in this world is, yes, we have God's word, we are sanctified, we separate ourselves from worldly things in order to appeal to those who want to escape the world, who want to escape the frustration and the emptiness of life, who even if they're not seeking God, they're seeking truth. They're seeking truth and they, do you know what? They can spot a fake a mile away. They want authenticity. They want, you know, it's not, it's not like, well, how can you remove as many difficulties as possible? And how can we make it as easy as possible for people to come to Christ? It's not about that. It's like, how can we be as authentic as possible? How can we take this word and live it out as clearly as I see it in the Bible, as clearly as it can be understood. And not to worry about who's going to like it or who's not going to like it. Because what we're offering is something far higher than that. We're not selling something. You know, it's not like, we're not like second-hand car salesmen trying to, trying to make a sale, got to make a sale. It's like, no, I have to be faithful to Christ. I have to offer this gospel as clearly uh, as truthfully as I can. I have to live it as truthfully as I can because I want to please God. And for those people who are seeking that, who are seeking God, who are seeking the truth, they don't care what coffee you've got or how long the sermon is or whether it's fun or not fun because they're seeking something higher. They're seeking salvation. You know, they want to be saved. They want to escape this world. They want to find that truth. They want to find ultimately they want to find God. We've got the answer. You know, but it's got to stick to this word and let this word correct you. Don't go around, don't go around being Bible correctors or apologizing for what the Bible says. I'm really sorry it says this. It's like that's what it says. God has spoken. And therefore it is what it is. And God's wisdom is higher than ours. God's understanding is higher than ours. So we have to defer to his wisdom. All right, let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word, and I do thank you, Lord, that it is the truth. And I do thank you, Lord, that 
the best place to be is in your presence, Lord. And with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, help us to maintain that harmony, that love of your word. Lord, help us to lay our lives down on the altar. Lord, so that uh, we can walk with you, Lord, in agreement with your word. Lord, please sanctify us by your spirit. In Jesus' name.